So in, in this chapter, uh, we are going to talk about fluids, compressible fluids. And uh, for, for this chapter, to look at uh, local existence. So the Cauchy problem and show that there exists a Cauchy development for initial data, which may have shocks or may even be regular if you, if you wish. But shocks are going to occur in any case. Even if you would assume the initial data to be smooth, shocks would occur uh, because we are talking about a compressible fluid. And, and that's a feature that happen in, a, in such a fluid uh, that, uh, if you like, the sound speed depends on the density, the local density. And the sound speed is changing. And, and there is a nonlinear phenomena that uh, makes uh, formation of shocks uh, you know, necessary. So the setup is, uh, so this is called, in fact, this is called the problem of gravitational collapse in spherical symmetry. And the model is really physically realistic. Uh, if you would take a scalar field to study this problem, it would also be interesting and quite challenging, and this has been done. Uh, but, but it's less, uh, definitely less physically realistic. Uh, this model of compressible uh, fluids leads you to shocks, and shocks through the Einstein equations uh, imply propagating curvature singularities, as we will see. And the goal is to solve the Cauchy problem when the data are weakly regular. And, uh, and you will see the way that I will formulate the Cauchy problem. So again, there are many ways to do that. Uh, but if you, if you want to study uh, especially the problem of the formation of trapped surfaces, which I will discuss uh, next time, uh, it's quite uh, relevant to, to put the, your initial data set on an incoming light cone. Um, I, I could probably make immediately a picture. So in, in the space-time, there will be a, an axis of symmetry that will correspond to uh, two spheres. Uh, I mean, the, the axis will correspond to the area being, uh, being zero of the two spheres. And uh, the cone, the, the past cone that we will work on will be a past cone uh, from a point on this axis of, uh, of symmetry in the space-time. So the, roughly the picture is like, it has light. We will return to it in a, in a few minutes. The space-time are, are non-vacuum compared to what we were doing before. So before we were looking at Ricci flat space-times uh, with weak regularity. And we, I mean, I presented a lot of techniques uh, that we will still use here. So how to define the Einstein equations in a weak sense, how to manipulate uh, weakly regular solutions. So these are techniques that we will still be using here. But in, in addition, we will have specific difficulties that come from the spherical symmetry. And we will have specific difficulties coming from the compressible fluid. The, the objective here is to show that there exists a broad class of such space-time starting from a large class of initial data sets. And uh, in, in the next chapter, I will say a little bit about this, uh, the next issues, uh, which is to study the global dynamics of these space-times. So can you, you know, say something about the global geometry and possibly the causal geometry? And there are many, many problems that have been uh, mostly solved in this very scaly symmetric uh, uh, setup uh, for scalar fields, uh, but which are only partially done, partially solved, when you have a matter model which is described by a compressible fluid. And, and two results I will, I will mention later on is the fact that if you have small mass initially, it's going to disperse in timeline directions. And a second result, the formation of trapped surfaces. Uh, when the mass is large. Uh, so you would have uh, light uh, which is, which is uh, you know, moving to the center, ba basically, instead of going outward. There are other results that you can also obtain by the same techniques I will present today, but they will correspond to different uh, symmetry assumptions. Uh, and also next time I will mention some results for cosmological spacetimes. Uh, using the same techniques, right? So now we, we no longer have a Ricci flat space-time, but we have a, sp a space-time where there is a fluid, the fluid is compressive, uh, and, and therefore we, there is no way around it 
we, we must uh, work in a, in a space of weekly regular space times. The outline uh, will be this. So I will start by prescribing, I mean, defining the, the coordinates I, I will be using. So the Eddington Finkelstein coordinates are, are good for the problem that we want to study. Uh, we will uh, then de define uh, the class of space times uh, we want to work with and, and the basic regularity or lack of regularity that will be assumed is this uh, property of uh, having bounded variation. So the derivative uh, of the freed variables, uh, these derivatives are, are measures. Uh, and of course, this is good if you want to capture space-time containing shock waves and curvature discontinuities. And then there will be the main result for this chapter about the existence of the Cauchy problem, of Cauchy developments with BV regularity. And, and you, you will see how this is done by constructing a, a sequence of approximation to the Einstein-Euler system, in fact, containing many shocks, right? So you know that shocks will occur, so why not constructing an approximate solution containing many shocks? And, and when you take some parameter, go to, to zero, to infinity, you actually uh, increase the number of shocks in your solution, and you converge eventually to the solution that you want. If, if we have time, um, I, I guess we, I, will, I will have time to present uh, two, uh, you know, two technical uh, points of, uh, of the theory, but not uh, at all the whole proof. And the two points will be the so-called Riemann problem, uh, for which there are interesting monotonicity properties, which are essential to control the sub-norm and the total variation norm of the solutions. And, and also, I will say a few words in the end about spherically symmetric static Einstein-Euler spacetimes, because what I have in mind here uh, it will be to take such a spacetime and add a perturbation. Right? This will be my way to define the initial data set. You take something static, and you, you add a fluid perturbation on top of that, and you, and you look for the co corresponding Cauchy development. And, and when you do this analysis, the, the, the Hawking quasi-local mass comes in, in the analysis. So it's interesting to, to see, and this mass has the monotonicity properties, etc. So, so this is a very important quantity. So, so let, let me uh, start with the formulation. So of course we need to choose coordinates right, for our problem and, and to, to formulate the initial data uh, more precisely. We are looking for Einstein-Euler spacetimes which are three plus one dimensional Lorentzian manifolds, uh, satisfying the Einstein equations, which we have to, understood, to understand in a weak sense, because T, this T will be only bounded quantity, you know, we'll describe uh, as, as I'm writing here. So T alpha beta uh, is uh, given by this expression for compressible fluids. Uh, and, uh, and so in this, uh, in this expression, of course, mu is the mass energy density of the fluid, so the local, the local quantity. U alpha is the velocity vector for the fluid. I have in introduced that uh, before. And uh, if you want to describe the, the fluid the content, the matter content of the spacetime, you also need to tell uh, how the pressure, P, is determined in terms of the mass energy density. And uh, to assume this linear property is not a real restriction and, and it's convenient for a uh, lot of, uh, of, of analysis. So k squared, uh, k represents the sound speed. Uh, the light speed is normalized to be one. And what we are going to do, we are going to solve the Einstein equations coupled to the Euler equations, which, as you know, uh, come from the Bianchi identities for the geometry. Right. So. So you have here uh, the set of equations that we want to solve. We want to solve the initial value problem for this system. And we will do that when the initial data set satisfies a spherical symmetry condition. So I'm assuming that SO3 acts as an isometric group on the spacetime. And I am a little bit more specific than, than that by assuming that there is a, a central world line which is invariant by the group, which will correspond to uh, the area uh, equal to zero in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in this picture. And the area I'm, I'm talking about is uh, defined by, uh, so assuming, I mean, this is an assumption that the group orbits are somehow not degenerate except on this uh, central axis. 
and through any point which is not on the central line, uh, the, the group orbits are, are two spheres. So in this picture, uh, at least if I would uh, draw it just in a, in a one plus one uh, picture, uh, every point corresponds to, to a sphere with a certain radius r and uh, a certain uh, coordinate uh, v which uh, will be used to, uh, to index uh, the cones that, uh, the incoming cones that we will use to foliate the space times. Right. So the space-time will, will be described by a foliation by hypersurfaces, which are uh, uh, in incoming cones, incoming slight cones, which are uh, centered at r equals zero, which is uh, a way to label the axis of symmetry in the space-time. And so every sphere here has an area and from the area of, uh, of the sphere, I decide to define uh, the radius, right? So the radius is given by the square root of capital A over 4 pi. So that's the definition of the radius in this space-time after you make these uh, symmetry assumptions. The initial hypersurface is this incoming, or one of the incoming light cones that, uh, that we have here. And so, so we will put data here. We will impose data. Uh, and more specifically, what I, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm assume, I will assume that these data are static initially. Uh, and on top of this static data, I will add a perturbation, which is localized. Of course, you could set up the problem, I mean, in many different ways. So for the techniques I will present about convergence and constructing approximate solutions to, uh, to the einstein euler spacetime, of course, the precise setup is not that uh, important. But, uh, but of course, we have to be a little bit specific to, to describe a, a result. And, and so the result will be like this. Uh, there's going to be a perturbation here uh, on top of a static uh, spacetime, slice in a spacetime. And, and the question I'm asking is, what happens in the future of this perturbation? Right. So, uh, so let, let us go through this. So we have a specially compact and, of course, weakly regular. So as I said before, there is no point to assume smoothness initially because these shocks will occur in any case. So it's, it's as well good uh, to take the initial data set to be weakly regular. And, and so it's a perturbation which is specially compact of a regular static solution, which uh, the static solution, of course, represents the fluid at the equilibrium. And the motivation behind this, uh, this picture is that what is quite uh, interesting is to look at the case of a short pulse. So short pulse would be this picture that uh, I made here, but instead of taking a general perturbation, this perturbation will, will be taken to, in some sense, to be a, a pulse to be, uh, you know, to be uh, sure to be concentrated, very big and concentrated in, in a certain way. Uh, and, and this idea of a pulse, not, not of course for uh, compressible fluids like I, I'm looking at here, uh, was first introduced by, by Dimitri Christodoulou uh, in order to, to analyze the dynamics of uh, space-time and the formation of trapped surfaces, which is uh, one reason uh, we have also here to, to consider this setup. The Schwarzschild spacetime uh, is, is given by this formula in Schwarzschild's coordinates. So let me remind you that the metric looks like this in a, in a so-called Schwarzschild coordinates where the radius is bigger than 2m. 2m is a singularity as, as most of you know uh, of, uh, of this metric, but, but it's not a, a real singularity, it's just an artificial singularity due to the bad choice of, uh, of coordinates. I'm not going to use these coordinates. I'm going to use the so-called Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates, where I keep the radius as I, I define it on the blackboard, so this will be one of the coordinates. And the other coordinate will be the so-called advanced time, which is obtained by, uh, by this relation here. Right? So it's roughly like t plus r, like you would do in a, 
you know, null coordinates for the wave equation, you would look at t plus r, t minus r. But there is an additional correction, if you like, involving the mass. So this is a correct definition of the advanced time. And if you write this metric in eddington finkelstein coordinates, uh, this is a form that you get. Okay. So it's just a, a change of variable, if you, if you like. But, uh, but the interest of the second choice of coordinates uh, comes from this fact that it's now regular when you cross what is the horizon r equals 2m, so this is the horizon of the black hole, but now you can cross this uh, horizon, uh, it, it does not correspond to a singularity of the metric coefficients, it only tells you that this quantity will change sign. And that's interesting, so these are useful for our purpose because they allow us to cross the horizon r equals 2m, you start uh, entering, you can enter the trapped uh, region of the space-time when r is less than 2m and, and if, you, if you look at the behavior of the geodesics this is a region where the radially outgoing non-geodesics are actually uh, moving towards the center, right? So you are inside the horizon uh, region, inside the black hole region. So, uh, so with this motivation, you know, with this explicit solution in mind, we have the idea to use eddington finkelstein coordinates or a generalization of these coordinates for our spacetime. And here they are. So we, we are going to write the Einstein equations in spherical symmetry in eddington finkelstein coordinates given by this. So we have a metric given by minus a b squared dv squared plus 2b dvdr and of course there is a, a part uh, which is a round metric, this is just a round metric on the two spheres uh, times the area to the square. We are therefore we are using the same advanced time that we had for this explicit Schwarzschild uh, spacetime. We have an area radius defined from, um, from the area of the orbits of symmetry. And, uh, and the metric is described by two coefficients. The quantity b is assumed to be positive like it was for Schwarzschild's, uh, but, but a may change sign. So a is a, is a coefficient that may change sign, and, and so this coefficient here uh, may be, uh, you know, may is not of a given sign. And uh, I now impose a, a final condition on, on the metric to describe the whole metric. What I'm also imposing now is this condition of regularity at the center. So if you approach the center, I don't want any mass li like you have in the Schwarzschild metric. So I don't want that. I want something regular, a space-time field with a regular matter, and on top of that I will put the perturbation. So this condition is telling me that the, the solution is smooth, is, is regular, does not contain any singularity at the center, so it says that A and B should go to 1 and 1 uh, when you approach the center. And, and of course, if you put 1 and 1 here, you just get the flat Minkowski matrix. That's what you want to, to say. The Einstein equations are, are not uh, difficult to write. I mean, it's, as usual, it's a bit technical to express uh, Christoffel symbols and the curvature and see uh, in coordinates what the Einstein equations are, are telling you. And, uh, and now you, you, we have to look at the structure of these equations, of course, carefully, uh, and make sure that we understand them in a weak sense. So you have four, four basic equations. So T0,0, T0,1, <coughs> etc. So I will only write schematically the equations on, uh, on the blackboard. Um, so let me see. So the first... Uh, okay, so le let me write the two equations here so we keep them. So BR is 4 pi uh, RB cubed T0,0. The second equation is R A R B plus a B minus B plus 2 R A B R is 8 pi R squared B squared T 0 1. 
Okay, so in a, in a minute we will use these two equations uh, in order to express a and b, the two coefficients in the metric. And, and there are more equations, which are, I'm, I'm not going to write in, in details, but there is one equation that contains a, a v derivative, uh, and this is equal to 8 pi r squared b t11. And we have an, another equation that uh, contains, you, you see that it contains, I mean, I'm, I'm only writing terms that do not appear in the other equation. So we will see how later, how we handle them. Uh, and you have also a second derivative of B in R, and you have also a B R V derivative, and there is also a B V derivative equal to uh, 16 pi R cubed, B cubed, T, 2, 2. Okay, so we need to find uh, a solution of the Euler system, so there will be fluid variables uh, also to, uh, to solve for, and, uh, and coupled to, to this uh, system, which has a uh, form which is not completely uh, obvious uh, at this moment, But, but there are other equations, of course, there are other components, right? I just wrote four components, but you have more components. And the other components, if you express them, they tell you this. So they tell you that T02, T03 should be zero, T12, T13 should be zero. And then you have a relation between T22 and T33, uh, and T23 should be zero. Okay. So these are conditions that you also obtain when you express the Einstein equations. But you, you cannot see them as uh, ODEs or PDEs, or they are just very extremely simple equations. And the way you want to see them is that they impose compatibility or restrictions on the matter model. Right? So you may have a matter model that does not satisfy that, and matter model that satisfies that. So hopefully the, our model will uh, satisfy these conditions. OK. so. What we do now is that we combine the T00 and the T01 equations, which are the first two equations on the, on the blackboard, and, uh, and we get that, right? So you just compute the combination B T00 minus T01. You get this. So you, you can see easily uh, the, the algebra uh, behind that. And, uh, and now what you can do now is you can integrate this uh, by s taking r1 minus a as the uh, noun. So you integrate this uh, and you introduce an exponential of the integral of this coefficient here. And, and this is a formula, right? So a can be expressed uh, as an integral of, uh, of something like uh, the mass I mean, this is very, I mean, this is a mass uh, energy density measure by an, an observer uh, in, in a certain direction. Uh, you have this weight here where, again, you have the mass uh, uh, here, the energy momentum, I mean, the T0,0 component of it. It's weighted by B. Of course, B is unknown. But if you know B and if you know the matter, you can compute A explicitly by this identity. I want to emphasize two things. First of all, to do this calculation, you use the regularity at the center. If you had some mass or something, there would be one more term in this uh, uh, condition, and I, I don't want that. So I have used the regularity at the center. And the second condition, which is related to this idea, uh, is, is that you want, to, uh, you want the formula to make sense and uh, you, you, need, you, know, you need an integrability condition in L1 lock, so it should be integrable at the origin uh, because you want to integrate from zero to a finite value. Now, a similar treatment can be done with the second equation, or oh, sorry, the first equation. Now you, here you have used the first two equations. Now you use a T00 equation uh, f from the Einstein system. You again use a regularity at the center. The fact that B is converging to 1 at the center is, uh, is used to derive this identity. And you obtain something you could view as an, an implicit, so it's not really explicit, but it's an implicit expression uh, that tells you implicitly that if you knew the matter content, or, sorry, if you, if you knew the matter content of the space-time, 
meaning that you, you would know T00 and T01. Then you could just plug them in, uh, in these two identities and solve implicitly for B. Right. So, so in that sense, uh, in that sense you, you can really think of that the matter, the matter content determines the geometry. And, and this is, of course, not a general fact. It comes from our assumption of spherical symmetry. As you know, there are more equations coming from the Einstein equations, I mean more non-trivial equations, which are these components uh, on the blackboard, the T101 and the T22 components. So I, I'm going to discuss that, how to uh, derive these two equations as, as a consequence of the first two, right? The last two should be a consequence of the first two. Uh, and again, everything has to be done in a weak sense. We, uh, we now continue and we would like to write the Euler equations to supplement the system. So that's what I, I'm going to do here. The matter model, uh, as you know, is, uh, is given by two nouns, the mass energy density mu of the fluid, it's a positive quantity, and a velocity vector, u alpha, so it has in principle four components. The norm of this vector is, uh, is unit, so in fact there are only three uh, components, if you like, three nouns that are to be determined. Um, in particular, u0 has to be non-vanishing. And what we are going to do here, a little bit like uh, we have done for the Einstein equations, would be to extract the essential equations from the Euler system. We are not going to keep all of them at, at first. We want to keep the essential equations, solve for them, and uh, understand why the other equations can be recovered. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm writing the divergence uh, condition for T alpha beta and only keeping beta to be zero or one. And what I hope is that the remaining two components where beta is equal to two or three uh, will be deduced from the above two equations and I, I'm going to discuss that in, uh, in some details. Uh, yet there are more, I mean, there are more equations you have to, to be careful uh, about, uh, which are these uh, remaining Einstein curvature components I, I mentioned before. So you, you need all these components to vanish, and this combination of T22 and T33 to vanish. Uh, and if you, if you look at the expression of the T alpha beta tensor, uh, so this condition can be satisfied, and they are satisfied exactly if the components u2 and u3 of the vector of the velocity vector field vanish. Okay. So, so there is no choice. This condition would not be necessary if you, for instance, if you would study the Euler system in a fixed uh, geometry. But the fact that we are looking at the coupling between Einstein and Euler, uh, and of course our symmetry conditions, Im implies this restriction that u2 and u3 um, are, are vanishing. So we proceed with this. We express the T00 Euler equation. So by T00 Euler equation, I mean, uh, I mean that I'm, I'm taking beta that was here to be zero. And I simply express now this in coordinates because we have our, our matrix. So I, I remind you that the matrix has been expressed in, uh, in this form. So, um, so, so we have the expression of the metric as uh, minus a b squared d v squared uh, plus uh, b, maybe there is a 2 here, 2 b d v d r plus r squared g s 2. So we have the expression of the metric in, in some coordinates. Uh, it's not difficult to compute the Christoffel symbols and uh, derive for the first Euler equation uh, this identity here. So, so observe that you have uh, a time derivative of T00, a space derivative of T01, and then you have lower order terms that contain no derivatives of T, T alpha beta, but they contain coefficients that involve first order derivatives of the metric. So that's the structure that you, you, you would expect. Uh, there is a second equation that you can also write, the T01 Euler equation. 
You start with this. You, again, just write the definitions, use the Christie expression of the Christopher symbols, and you find the similar structure, that you have a time derivative of t01, space derivative of t11, and you have lower order terms that contain t00, the coefficient, t01, t11, t22 with the coefficient. And at most, the derivatives here of the metric coefficients are uh, first order at most. Uh, so let me also recall the expression of the energy momentum tensor. So this is needed now if you want to replace T00, T01, T11 by their expressions. You also remember that uh, I, I explained that U alpha has in fact only one component. So if I, I can express everything in terms of the component U1, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, but okay, at this moment, I, I'm going to still to keep U0. But U0 and U1 are related by expressing the fact that the norm of the vector field is, 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 is 1, of the velocity vector field is 1. And uh, so what you see here are simply the, uh, the expression that we had here, right? The T00, T01, T11 system. So I'm looking at this, and I, I just replace T alpha beta by, by this, and I use the fact that u2 and u3 are vanishing. So this is what I get. I get two equations. Uh, so they look a little bit uh, more, uh, more complicated, but they, they have this form. They are quadratic in terms of u0 uh, here. You know, you have u0, 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 u1. And the next one has a, a u0, u1, and a u1, one term. And, uh, and you have Okay, lower order terms. Uh, these three lines, for instance, do not contain derivatives of u or derivatives of mu. All the mu and u derivatives are on the first line. And, and you have pretty much now the full system, or I would say the essential system that we want to solve. So we have these two equations plus uh, the first two equations from the Einstein system on the, on the blackboard. And all of that, in principle, should be a closed system. To see the structure more precisely, I need to introduce some notation. So I, I'm going to introduce now something I have called normalized free, free variables. I would like to simplify this system in order to see the algebraic structure as, uh, as, uh, you know, as clearly as possible. And so it turns out that uh, if you define uh, u0, u0, b squared times mu, so it's, it's, really, you know, it's really the density, the mass energy density weighted by yeah, the square, I mean, like it is written, right? Some, some component from the velocity and some component from the geometry. So if you weight mu in this way, uh, and you call it capital M, and if you also introduce this combination of, uh, of the velocity, so it's u1 over u0 also modified by the metric coefficient. Uh, these two variables are actually quite convenient. And they allow you to rewrite the component of the energy momentum tensor in a more reasonable way compared to what we had before. So t0, 0 is, is a, a, a constant here, m over b squared. t01 is m over b, a, co a constant here times uh, combination of A and V, uh, and T11 is, is capital M times this uh, quadratic. You, you, you can see that this is like a quadratic polynomial in, in V squared, and this was linear in capital V, and this was constant in capital V, if you, if you wish. And T22 has, uh, has this form, 2K squared over R squared, M times C. I have also introduced this notation. So K, I remind you, was the sound speed. And, and it turns out that this coefficient comes. So capital K is the square root of this uh, specific ratio uh, defined from the sound speed. So, uh, so we have two variables. And now we are going to write with these two variables, capital M, capital V. Uh, and we keep the small a, small b from the geometry. Uh, but before we can actually do that, we have to transform the, these two Euler equations from the T00 uh, and the T11 Einstein equations, so which are 
like the second one and uh, maybe the third one on the blackboard, uh, I, I, do the, I compute this combination, A, B, T, 0, 1, minus T, 1, 1. And it's, uh, it's easy to see that this combination is equal to a multiple of A sub V, uh, which tells me that if I return to the Euler equation that we, we had here, you return to this, now you can kill, uh, the probably, yeah, you, you see that there is a term A sub V here. Maybe that's, that is only one. So what I'm telling you now is that this term A sub V uh, can be eliminated from the second essential Euler equations. In the first one, I don't see any A sub V, but there is a B sub V that, uh, for which we will have a similar observation in a second. So we can eliminate A sub V from the Euler equations. Now, next uh, remark, I can also eliminate B sub V, but doing something different. I, I cannot compute B sub V uh, by our equations, at least not in a useful way. I mean, I could compute it probably from the third, I mean, the last equation on the blackboard, uh, but it would not, be very, uh, would not be very useful because it would tell you that B sub V, you know, maybe would be expressible in terms of second are derivatives of A and B, but that's definitely uh, not what you should do. So what you, what you want to do, now you want to make a combination of the two Euler equations, uh, which you see here. So you compute this combination, B squared T0,0, zero zero, uh, for the first equation, and for the second one you compute the time derivative of B T0,1. And it, it turns out that when you do that, uh, this uh, this uh, B sub V uh, term is, uh, is gone. So again, I have found a way to transform the equation and this term is, is gone, and which is good because I, I could not express it in a, in a useful way. Now, next uh, step is to also observe that you can eliminate B sub R, but this is done in, a, in the following way. So before, in the previous form, B squared was actually outside the sp space derivative. So I put it inside and I add lower order terms. And I do the same here, B was outside, I put it inside the R derivative, and I add uh, the corresponding lower order terms. And by uh, a few more uh, calculations, I realize that the combination I get uh, here involving BR can be eliminated, because I, what I, I, I get is a specific combination of BR and AR, which by uh, the T01 component of the Einstein equations uh, is equal to an expression that contains no derivative at all. Okay. So I, I've done all these transformations, I mean a couple of transformations, and, and there is one more remark to also eliminate B sub R uh, from the first Einstein equation. And by, by doing that, what you observe is that the right-hand side of the Euler system can be uh, completely free of derivatives of the metric coefficients. So not only free of derivatives of, uh, of the matter variables, but also of the metric variables. And you get that. You get that. So, so this is actually this is a system that I will, uh, I will work with. And to have a, a compact uh, form of, uh, of that, I'm going to introduce a notation, which uh, which is uh, which is this. So I have a couple of possible formulations, but uh, this is what we have obtained now. If I define capital U uh, to be this quantity, and probably I should keep on the blackboard. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I should keep some of that on, uh, on the blackboard. So if we use these reduced fluid variables, we are able to express the, uh, the Euler equations, the essential equation in the form dv of capital U plus uh, dr of capital F of U, A, and B equal to some quantity S 
of u, a, and b. And all these uh, expressions, so u, I, I could probably also write the expression. So u is, is m for the mass, uh, the normalized mass energy density. And the second component is m times uh, a over 2 plus k squared times capital V. And the other expressions, this capital F and this S, are uh, algebraic expressions in terms of capital U, small a, and small b. So that's the structure that we have. Uh, and we need to solve that where uh, u, a, and b may contain shocks. Right? Will, will not be smooth uh, at all. I wrote the expressions of S here, which are the ones that I have obtained from the previous slides. And uh, I'm going to repeat this uh, important fact that the curve geometry, the curve space-time geometry, can be determined once you know the matter content. There is no dynamical uh, gravitational degree of, uh, of freedom. I mean, this is a way that uh, physicists state it. If you work in a radial symmetry, uh, there is no propagation which is associated with uh, the, the geometry of the space-time. All the propagation comes from the matter fields. In this case, all the propagation comes from, from the fluid and is described by the system, which we will see in a minute is a hyperbolic, is a nonlinear hyperbolic system. In, and another way to say that is to, 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 to look at this, uh, this expression. So A and B are given by integral expressions uh, where Maybe the second line could be, you know, look at first. So if you know M and V, then you can compute B by, by this line, and then you can plug the, the expression for B uh, in, uh, in this form here. And, and for instance, this ratio here, because this is an exponential, it turns out to be the an integral, an integral between uh, R and R prime. So it's like uh, the mass, uh, you know, the mass quantities that you have between these two, two spheres of radius R and our primes that uh, comes, uh, comes here. Oh, OK, so the structure is rather nice. And the challenge now will be to be able to establish a, a result, a global result of existence of weak solutions for that. But before we can do that, we, we need to define you know, the space, the class of, uh, of solutions that we want to work with. If you would assume, I mean, if you would insist on looking for only for smooth solutions and assuming that the initial data are smooth, you could do that, right? And what you would get, you would get a solution defined for possibly a very small time um, and would not be, you know, it would not be so relevant and, and for sure it, you would be unable to say anything about the global geometry and the causal geometry of your space time. So you must look for solutions that have a very low level of regularity and contain shocks. That's what I, I'm doing here by introducing this uh, class of solutions, of functions. So I, I denote it by BV log. This is a class of functions of one variable which have locally bounded variation in, in the variable R. Uh, what this means is that it, when you look at the derivative in the sense of distributions, it's a measure, it's a locally bounded measure. You can look at the mass of this measure, which I denote by df over dr on some interval, like 0, r0, and call this quantity the total variation of your function. You also have the, the property that uh, BV functions admits left and right hand tra traces at uh, each point. So you can think in some way, I mean formally, you can think of BV functions as being piecewise Lipschitz or piecewise regular functions with uh, uh, isolated, uh, I mean not isolated jumps, because the jumps can accumulate, the jumps can be, uh, they can be countably many, they can accumulate. So of course the structure is not rigorously that, but, but in, in spirit, uh, this is what you, you should have in mind here. You want to work with functions that are, are maybe could be smooth and they have a, a jump and smooth again, a jump, etc. And that's the kind of uh, solutions 
that you, you want to work with. Uh, of course, there is also the time variable. So my, my functions will be in L infinity log, BV log, uh, meaning that you have also independence, uh, dependence in an additional variable V. And the local total variation in R is assumed to be locally bounded in this uh, time variable. This will not be uh, enough because it doesn't say anything about the regularity in time. So you expect that. Of course, in time, you don't want the shocks to jump in a completely crazy way. So you want a certain continuity uh, of the solutions in time. And this will be expressed by this property that if you compute the Lipschitz um, you know, regularity in time, uh, so, so that's, that's the norm I'm going to use. But I'm going to use that Lipschitz regularity in time with values in L1. And this is compatible with, uh, with uh, the possibility to have shocks that uh, interact and produce new shocks or several shocks, etc. So the dynamics of the shocks in solutions is very well described by this space. And this regularity in time and this additional continuity in time with values in L1. This is my formal definition, a spherically symmetric Einstein Euler spacetime with bounded variation is a spacetime described in generalized Eddington Finkelstein coordinates by this metric involving two coefficients a and b. It, it is also represented by two fluid variables normalized in, in the way I explained before. M is, is a positive quantity. V, maybe I didn't mention that, but capital V has been normalized to vary between minus infinity and 0. And to, to write this definition, I'm assuming that I have a slab between two, uh, two hypersurfaces, two past null cones. And the regularity, uh, if you li like, in, uh, in this result is, is expressed in a, in, a region like, uh, in a region like this, right? A region contained between two hypersurfaces. The regularity at the center is, is something I mentioned before. And it, it remains now to close this uh, definition. This is really a definition of what we want to call spherically symmetric spacetime with BV regularity. So the, it remains to, to tell, to state the BV regularity. And it's stated in the following way. You take the normalized mass times R and the velocity, normalized velocity. And I, I'm requiring that this is BV in space and uh, Lipschitz in time, in, in this sense. I'm also requiring that the V derivatives, the R derivatives, the uh, R derivative of B, you know, exactly these quantities weighted, AR is weighted by R. Uh, these quantities should have also BV regularity in space and uh, Lipschitz continuity in time. And, and finally, of course, I require that the Einstein and Euler equations are satisfied in a weak sense. And what I mean by this is that all of the equations I, I mentioned before should be satisfied, not only the essential equations that we have derived. So there would be an issue to go from the uh, essential equations to, uh, to the full system of Einstein-Euler. Uh, and uh, before we do that, let me, uh, let me emphasize that this equation is satisfied uh, as an equality between BV functions. Uh, the second equation is also satisfied as an equality between BV functions. The essential Euler equations hold only as locally bounded measures because uh, remember that U is defined from uh, capital M, capital V, which are, they are BV, they are BV regularity. So you can indeed compute the distributional derivative with respect to V or with respect to R, but what you will get is uh, only a measure, locally bounded measure. So this is satisfied in, in this weak sense. There are additional Einstein equations, which I also rewrote here in a, in a little bit more compact form. This is satisfied. It involves two now two derivatives of these coefficients which are in BV. So uh, this equation is only satisfied as an equality between bounded measures. And the final equation on A sub V uh, is satisfied in, uh, in BV. So I have a, a couple of observations here to, to complete this slice. First of all, there is no regularity required on B sub V 
right? So it's not something that you know you could do uh, just automatically. You really have to look carefully at the structure of your system, and and so the, the proper formulation is uh, is like this: B sub V has no uh, regularity, or at least not a regularity of the type I stated. Uh, the second remark is that the integral formula that uh, we have for uh, A and B makes sense b because we have put the uh, correct integrability conditions for uh, this uh, formula to make sense. And uh, globally, the Einstein equations are satisfied as equalities uh, within uh, locally bounded measures. So on this screen, we have again you know, a statement of the system that we want to solve, at least the essential part of it. Uh, but now, in addition, we have also specified the spaces, the functional spaces that uh, we, look, uh, we, we are looking the solution in. The initial data set is uh, of the form I introduced before. We have an incoming light cone uh, with vertex on this uh, center line. And on uh, this incoming light cone, we put uh, some matter which is prescribed, uh, I mean, it can be prescribed in a, in a general form, right? If you, if you don't want to think first at the setup where you have a static space time and a perturbation, this is, of course, not uh, essential to put, to formulate the definition. And, and so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just assuming that I prescribe M and V on my initial hypersurface in, a, in this way. These functions are positive or negative and have locally bounded variation. And I don't need to specify more information for the initial data set in spherical symmetry. If you have these two quantities to describing the matter content, you can actually recover the initial geometry, A0, B0, from this data M0, V0, exactly by this explicit formula that I wrote uh, before. And they do satisfy the required regularity uh, conditions. So this quantity here belongs to BV, if you compute them from the integral formula. And they do satisfy this, uh, this uh, property uh, on, uh, uh, at, uh, at the center. Now, we, uh, we need to discuss uh, reduction from the essential Einstein-Euler system to the full system. And, and this is really an issue that comes from the spherical symmetry. I mean, you have seen before, right, without imposing the symmetry, of course, there, there were similar, some issues related to that, uh, but, but they were very different uh, nature. So here, the spherical symmetry implies that uh, it leads you to equations that are repeat themselves. So you, you have to extract the ones that you want to solve for and show that the non-essential equations can be recovered. To state uh, this, I'm going to state a couple of lemma, you know, to try to make this issue as clear as possible. I, I do that uh, under weak regularity without imposing any additional uh, uh, initial data or any additional condition. And to state the results, I, I want to call the full system the system that contains four metric equations and four fluid equations. Of course, you remember that we had more Einstein equations, but I told you that they, they had to be seen as compatibility conditions on the matter model. And I'm going to call the essential system the one that you obtain with the two metric equations and the two fluid equations that we, we extracted from the big system. If you consider a uh, self gravitating compressible fluid in spherical symmetry and in, in the coordinate that we choose, any solution, MV, AB to the essential system, is actually a solution to the full system. And what uh, I, I mean to repeat that, if you have a uh, solve for the T00 and the T01 metric equations and the T00 and the T01 fluid equations, then keeping the same weak regularity assumptions without introducing any uh, initial data and any additional regularity, all of the Einstein-Euler equations are satisfied in, uh, in a weak sense. So to prove that, you have to dig into the structure of, uh, of the system. And uh, I do that in a couple of lemma. 
by introducing this notation. Capital B is a log of small b. Capital X is just some, uh, uh, some uh, quantity defined like this. A, B squared, you differentiate, you divide by B. So just some combination of first order derivatives of A and B. And you know that the Einstein equations are equivalent to uh, four equations for these components here, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 2. So these are the non-trivial components. You uh, also already know that there are additional conditions regarded as restrictions on the energy momentum tensor. So there are these ones. And I'm going to say now that an energy momentum tensor, so what I'm going to say is, is actually more general than just for the compressible fluids. It applies to other matter, matter models. So I'm going to say that an energy momentum tensor is compatible with spherical symmetry if you precisely have uh, these Einstein equations satisfied okay, by T alpha beta. So all these components are zero and this is zero. And the observation for us is that we, we do have uh, this property for perfect compressible fluids uh, provided we assume, uh, and this is really a necessary and sufficient condition, we assume that U2 and U3 are vanishing. So we are in that situation. And now what we want to do, we want to assume some of these equations to assume this compatibility condition with spherical symmetry and show that the other equations are satisfied. Okay. So, uh, so first step, let's recover the T02 and the T03 Euler equation. So if the matter tensor is compatible with spherical symmetry, then I, I'm claiming that the T02 and T01 Euler equations can be recovered, and by uh, T02, T03, I just mean, I mean this. So uh, for the proof, you uh, recall that by our assumption of spherical symmetry, you have no uh, effect of derivatives in theta and phi, which were my notation for the coordinates on the two spheres. Um, so you have only R and V derivatives, of course. And you look at uh, the divergence of uh, T alpha 2. Uh, and what I claim here is that this comes, this follows, uh, if you have the conditions T02, T12 is 0. So these are just some of the compatibility conditions. So if you assume all of them, of course, you have that. Uh, and, and this condition, which is also one of, uh, of that list. Uh, so why is it so? Simply because working in a weak sense, you can compute uh, the divergence T alpha, T, uh, nabla alpha, T alpha 2. So that's what I'm doing here. So I compute one, two, three. There are four terms to be computed. And for each, you, 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 know, you just uh, take into account uh, these, uh, these conditions here, and it's pretty much uh, immediate. Uh, but, but just realize that these compatibility conditions are, are, are really necessary uh, if, uh, if you want to, to, to do that. There is a similar calculation that works, of course, with the other equation, nabla alpha t alpha 3 is equal to 0, where now you use some uh, other uh, component that these quantities are equal to 0. Let's now recover the t to 2 Einstein equations. And the next two are not that direct, I would say. If you assume that the T00, T01 Einstein equations are satisfied and the T00 Euler equations are satisfied uh, and the matter is compatible with spherical symmetry, then I can recover the T22 components. And what uh, I'm doing here, I'm writing uh, nabla alpha T alpha 0 to be 0 because this is our Euler equation. You express what, what you have here and uh, and you, uh, you now use the expression for T00, T01 that you have from the Einstein equations. Right. Uh, so, so what I'm, I'm doing here, I'm uh, replacing, I mean, computing these components by differentiating. So T00 is obtained by differentiating in, uh, in, uh, in V, right, in time, uh, the expression that you had in the first Einstein equations. And then you, you compute out what, uh, what it means. 
And then you do the same for the T01 component that you can get from uh, the second Einstein equations. And you, you get something like this. And then you plug these two things here, and you get, you get some, uh, some identity. And the identity allows you to compute this component, T22. So T22 is equal to all the rest. And, and, and it turns out that this is the equation that you wanted to recover. So, uh, I mean, all of these things are, seems like a small exercise, but, uh, but they are, some of they contain some deep, uh, there's some deep understanding behind, uh, behind that, and, 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 and this is something that you cannot avoid, right? And, and you have to be careful to, to check that this is true in a weak sense, and, and that's indeed uh, uh, something that can be done. Uh, the T101 component, the story is a little bit different, if you assume now that you have T00, T01, T22 for Einstein, and if you have T01 for Euler, and the compatibility with spherical symmetry, then you can recover T11 for the Einstein system. But you can do that if you use the regularity of the metric at the center, which I didn't use so far for, for this step, and uh, something uh, additional concerning the, the matter. That again says that at the center you have not concentrated matter and, and something at the center of symmetry. So I need these two conditions in order to uh, complete this argument. And, and the proof goes along similar lines as, as before. You express the Euler equations in, a, in your coordinates. You can, uh, you, you, you know, you have expressions for T00 T01, T22 from the Einstein equations. Uh, so you, you collect uh, that and you realize that this time you, you don't get the result. I mean, directly, what you obtain is an, is an ODE for T11 in the R coordinates. So I get T11, which I'm, I'm looking for. Right? This is a T11 quantity that uh, I would like uh, to, to describe, somehow to recover. And what I get. Is, uh, is this equation for T11 uh, with a certain source. The source is given by this uh, big uh, quantity here. And I, I need uh, to show that the only solution of this equation that I just wrote, right? You have an equation here, T11 differentiated in R plus a coefficient T11 equals some source. And I need to show that the only solution of that is the one that I want. I want to show that T11 is equal to G11 over A pi. This is a component of the Einstein system that I'm looking for, for this step. Right? So, so you want to show that, right? You want to show that T11 is really equal to G11 over A pi. And this is something that you do by looking at the homogeneous equation. So this is the same equation I just wrote for T11, except that now I'm calling capital F the announce. And I, I rewrote the coefficient of T11 in a, in a slightly different form. Uh, the solution of this homogeneous equation are multiple of, of that. It's, it's uh, direct. G11 over 8 pi is a particular solution. This is something that you can check from the Bianchi identities. So you know that G alpha beta is diversion free. So you express a diversion free property for this component, G1. You use, uh, again, the compatibility of, uh, of the matter uh, like this. And you obtain that G11 is indeed a solution of, uh, of, uh, of your equation for at the end of the previous slides. So what is the conclusion at this uh, stage? The conclusion is that T11 is a sum of this uh, special solution, this particular solution G11, which is also expressed by, by, by all this uh, quantity. Plus, plus a C, right? Plus a contribution from this homogeneous equation. So I still need to kill this homogeneous equation, this capital C. And this is precisely the regularity at the center that tells me that I can kill this constant C. This constant C is, is really the difference that I have between G11 and, and 8 pi T11. And I need, uh, I need this condition of regularity at the center in order to kill this uh, constant of integration. I think it's a, good, uh, it's a good time to make a break, and we continue uh, after the break with the existence of the Cauchy developments. BV, regular Cauchy developments. 
to, to be more specific, I'm going to define uh, something like this, compact fluid perturbation problem. So what this is, we have a self-gravitating compressible fluid in spherical symmetry. We look for weak solutions, capital M, V, normalized uh, fluid variables and metric coefficient A and B, solutions to the essential einstein euler system in eddington fickelstein coordinates. And we formulate the initial data set in the following way, we have a fluid at equilibrium, which is uh, represented by uh, static space-time, which I denote by, uh, by this. So I put a tilde on, uh, on the components uh, M, V, A, B of the space-time. And such a space-time can be determined once you prescribe the mass-energy uh, density at the center. So there is, in fact, a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you give me uh, the, the mass density at the center, uh, there is a unique fluid equilibrium which corresponds to this uh, fluid density at the center, uh, provided the regularity at the center is imposed. So I'm, I'm taking this for a fixed density at the center. I have a unique space-time, and I, I take that as a solution of reference. And I, on the initial hypersurface, uh, which is this incoming light cone, I prescribe a localized uh, BV regular perturbation, meaning that M0 would be something close to M tilde, V0 close to V tilde, and therefore A0 and B0 will be close to A tilde, B tilde. And in, in addition to, 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 to be of this sort, you have the condition of uh, the perturbation being specially compact. So the, the way you can think of it is that it is localized, the perturbation is localized within two spheres of radius r star minus delta and r star plus delta. I fix an r star and I look at a small neighborhood which is measured by, by this parameter delta. For, for this chapter, in fact, the precise setup, these parameters will not uh, directly uh, appear in a, in a main statement. So the philosophy is simply that you have a localized perturbation uh, on uh, equilibrium. And we ask for a Cauchy development, which represents the evolution of the fluid in the future. We do know that shocks will, uh, will occur. And, and maybe I, I will say later a few words about, about that, but, but the system is, uh, as we will see, is uh, strictly hyperbolic, uh, generally nonlinear, and, and these properties imply the formation of shocks. The shocks correspond to curvature singularities in the space-time. And the result that I will state, but you can, again, you can look at other setup if you, if you wish, <laughs> by the property, uh, so in my statement, by the property of finite speed of propagation, I'm going to ensure that the space-time remains static in the neighborhood of the center of symmetry of r equals zero. So I made already the, the picture on the blackboard before, so you have that in mind. And in particular, I can compute the domain of dependence. We have finite speed of propagation, so if I know that the perturbation is initially localized uh, between two spheres of radius r star minus delta and r star plus delta, then I can define uh, radius uh, capital R star minus and capital R star plus. That depends on V, so they will, they will uh, expand, they will grow in terms of V, and the region uh, of uh, where the space-time is non-static will, will grow, will increase, and it will increase in a way that you can measure by, by this. So you just put C star V minus V zero um, with a minus sign and the same quantity with a plus sign. And what is this C star? C star is an upper bound for the wave speeds uh, describing the waves, uh, wave speed of propagation uh, in solutions to the Euler equations. And we will have an explicit form for that la later on. The perturbation is initially supported in this region. So, so here you look at the support of, uh, of your data. Um, yeah, actually, this is not initially, but this is on any hypersurface. So you take any hypersurface of your foliation, and on any hypersurface, you, you know that the support of your solution minus a static solution will be uh, compact, the support will be compact, and it's, it's described, or at least it's included, in the region with, which is described by, by these, uh, these quantities here. The solutions are, are going to be defined uh, for a certain time interval, 
And what, uh, what I, I will do, I will assume for, for simplicity, I mean for, for this specific problem, I will assume that uh, the waves do not have time to reach the center. So I start away from the center, the shocks propagate, so that will be shock, the shocks propagate, but I, I keep myself in a situation where the shocks have not uh, uh, hit the center yet. So the main theorem is, is like this, existence of BV regular Cauchy developments, you consider uh, the, this compact fluid perturbation problem with data prescribed on a light cone, HV0, in uh, generalized Eddington Finkelstein coordinates, and the result we, we will show now, I will sketch a proof, is that there exists a BV regular Cauchy development uh, which describes spherically symmetric, uh, spherically symmetric space time with bounded variation, satisfying the, the prescribed initial data set that you put on H0, HV0, and includes, so this region that I construct by this theorem at least includes a space time region which I can determine by uh, taking the maximal time V star restricted, only restricted by the condition that the space time is static near the center line. Right? And this, is, this can be quantified in terms of the constant the speed C star that I introduced, I have introduced in a, in a previous slice. Okay. So, uh, so again, it's not, you cannot, it's not a local existent result, it's, it's really a, a large existent result uh, if, if the perturbation is far from the center then it exists for a long time. Okay. And in particular, if you want a specific uh, feature to occur, like uh, formation of trap surfaces, uh, this is something that we can ensure with this result. I have two uh, regularity conditions here. The BV regularity, of course, is satisfied. This is part of our conclusion. But you can try to quantify the BV norm. And the total variation of R, M, V, uh, R, A, R, B, R, and A sub V, so all these quantities describing our space-time uh, at time v. So this quantity here, if you compare it to the reference value given by your static solution, so you compute the difference of the two and, and you look at the total variation, this quantity is, is bounded on, uh, on every slice of, uh, of the foliation. On uh, every slice of the foliation, you compute this total variation and you, you have the, the, the statement is telling you that this total variation cannot be bigger than uh, twice, if, if you like, there is a constant, some universal constant that comes here, uh, say twice, uh, the initial total variation, which I measure in the following way. So I take R, M0 minus M tilde, and I compute the total variation, plus the total variation of V0 minus V tilde. And we have a similar statement for the time continuity. If now you compute the Lipschitz uh, norm, uh, so I, I look at uh, m and v at time v, and I, I, you know, I compare the same expression at time v prime in L1 norm. So this quantity depends on v and v prime. And what I, I'm, I'm telling is that you have Lipschitz continuity in, uh, in v. We do know that some uh, singularities may occur from the center, so it's quite natural to first study this problem and not touch uh, the center. So, so for this chapter, this is going to be the main result. And uh, now what I, I should do is tell you some elements of proof of that, uh, knowing that the proof is, is quite long and technical, and I'm not going to tell you to really present the proof but I can present some elements of, of the proof, which uh, I think are quite uh, interesting. The outline of the method of proof is like, follow, is like this. We are going to construct a sequence of approximate solutions, which I denote by this notation, M sharp, V sharp, etc. And since I know that shocks will occur, I will take the point of view that why, why not including many shocks in, in the solution. So I will look for a solution that contains many shocks, and, and the parameter that I'm going to use, which is behind this notation, there is a parameter of discretization. This parameter will be such that when I let the parameter go to zero, I will have more and more shocks in my solution. And eventually, this uh, approximate solution is going to converge to the solution that I want. To begin with, you discretize the initial data set on the hypersurface v, HV0. So you are, you are given M0, V0, and the corresponding metric coefficient A0, B0, and you replace, what you do first is that you replace uh, these functions by piecewise constant approximations 
with finitely many jumps. Right? So you have an arbitrary function which may have discontinuities, and you replace it by something which is piecewise constant. So the constant will correspond to equilibria, if you, if you, if you like, at some level of, uh, of the description. And you, you allow yourself to put uh, many, many jumps. So, of course, finitely many, but possibly a very large number of jumps. You do that in such a way that you do not increase the total variation, which you are given initially, computed from M0, V0. That's possible. And then what I, I do, I look at the neighborhood of each discontinuity, and I solve something which is called the Riemann problem. And I, I'm going to return to that. This is one element of, uh, of the proof. So there is something called the Riemann problem, which is a Cauchy problem, a very specific Cauchy problem, when the initial data consists of uh, two constant states with a single discontinuity. You, you take the simplest situation, you take a shock, and you, you wonder whether this shock will propagate or, or something else could, uh, could occur. It may split into several waves, and, and that's the question that you have to address. If you, you want to understand the dynamics of, uh, of this initial data, for at least for a small time. So I'm going to define an approximate solution in the neighborhood of each discontinuity. Uh, and I, I will give a formula in a, in a few minutes. And then the, the method uh, uh, advance in time-like directions by introducing a discrete foliation by incoming null cones. So you, you had a, a continuous foliation, but this continuous foliation will be replaced by a discrete foliation, where I will choose, uh, I will choose uh, discrete values of the parameter V which I will call v1, v2, v3, etc. In, in a minute. Um, then I will jump, in, in some sense, I will jump from one hypersurface to, to the other and define my approximate uh, solution from one hypersurface to, to the, next, uh, the next one. If everything goes well, you, you, you are going to construct, uh, to, to have a global construction and, and get an approximate solution which represents approximately the solution that you, you are interested in. There is an ingredient here that comes in a, in a picture when I jump from one slice to another to the next one. Actually, I do that uh, by using an equidistributed sequence. Okay, so there is some, some, some technical aspect, but which is interesting, is that the shocks that I have at a given time on a given hypersurface uh, will somehow generate new shocks in a new hypersurface. But the way that you, you make this step involves an, uh, a random choice. And the way you could think about it is that the shocks will, will not propagate uh, from one slice to the other uh, directly, but will somehow oscillate, will, will move in a random way, and, and this random choice is, is necessary for the method to, uh, to converge. If you have enough bounds, uniform bounds, and, and this is really some big issue here, uh, you, you could do that, but maybe the construction will collapse after a few steps because uh, your density may become negative or, you know, you could have something that becomes crazy wh when you try to construct these approximate solutions. So, so you have to make sure that the reasonable uh, norms or some, some norms of the solutions are preserved, so the su some sub-norm uh, quantities and, and the total variation, which is the main quantity uh, in order to establish the compactness of this uh, sequence of approximate solutions. You, you want these bounds to be independent of the discretization parameters that come in, uh, in this. Right? So, so it's not a priori clear that the method will uh, make sense. I mean, first of all, because I didn't explain yet what I really mean by Riemann problem and approximate solution of Riemann problem, but, but you can imagine that when you do this construction, y you know, things may uh, become ill-defined uh, if you are not careful enough. The Riemann problem, so let me repeat and explain this uh, uh, better. It's a simplest, non-trivial Cauchy problem. It's, an, it's a problem where the initial value, the initial data set, uh, is, uh, is, is made of, uh, of constants. So you could think of equilibria. It's like having a fluid at equilibrium, and then you take a jump, and you, you have another piece of fluid at equilibrium. Right? And you, you would like to, to know what happens uh, in, a, in a neighborhood of this jump. And it, it can be sometimes that the jump will, depending on the values, this jump will, will propagate, will remain a jump for a small time, or the jump may, may split into several waves. And I'm going to describe this in, uh, in more details. This is something that we address for the Euler system that we, that we have here. So you remember that we wrote it in, uh, in this form, 
with something which is sometimes called a conservative variable, a flux variable, and a source term. Say. In the initial jump, I'm going to put it at, uh, at some time v prime uh, and at some uh, radius location r prime. So I really have this uh, uh, situation here that I'm going to solve for capital U, which is essentially like capital M, capital V, where the initial data at v prime, the time v prime, has a jump uh, exactly at uh, r prime. Right? And some of the value away, I mean far from r prime, are, are irrelevant for, uh, for this part of the discussion. Because what I really do, it's like I'm making a zoom you know, near a single discontinuity, and I want to analyze the dynamics of a single discontinuity. And this is what this Riemann problem is, uh, is doing for you. Of course, this problem cannot be solved in a closed form. Right? You have a rather involved system, so there is no way that you could uh, solve it explicitly. But if you only look for something approximate that is only valid asymptotically near the point, uh, you, you can do it. And we, we will see that uh, in the next section that we can construct approximate solutions which are sufficiently accurate to, uh, to remain useful in a neighborhood of, uh, of this intersection. I'm not going to use. Uh, I'm not going to use the. the uh, sorry. Let, let, let me say that you have this Riemann problem, which itself uh, is is already quite uh, quite involved. And I will split. I will decompose the solution of the Riemann problem into two two ideas, two steps. One step will be to look at the homogeneous Riemann problem, the meaning that I, I'm going to forget about the effect of the geometry and, and the source term. So the geometry will be gone, and I, I'm going to look at a very simple problem, which will have uh, scale invariant properties. And on top of that, of course, I need to take the geometry into account. So what I explained with this page here is how you take the geometry into account if you know already how to solve the homogeneous Riemann problem, which is a problem where I, I forget the source, and I, I take A prime, B prime to be constants. So, so this is the answer. If I want to take the geometry into account, and I already ha know how to solve this, I'm going to define the solution, the approximate solution of this Riemann problem as being the one which is the solution of the homogeneous problem without this term, without the effect of the geometry. And then I will take into account the geometry in a certain way. Okay. So maybe the precise form of that is, is not that important for the discussion uh, uh, today, but, uh, but there is a way to somehow correct the very simple uh, solver, Riemann solver, that I, I'm going to describe uh, by taking the geometry into account in, in a way which is, of course, it's not exact, but it's, it's enough, the accuracy of it is, is enough to uh, proceed with our approximation scheme. So geometry uh, is uh, described by the source term, and the source term also not only now it involves uh, S that I have defined before, but it also involves the uh, dependence of uh, A, B with respect to R. So it's a little bit uh, involved, and, and the formula is, uh, is, uh, is something like that. So it's not quite the source that we had before, because you also need to take into account the fact that this A and B uh, depends on, uh, on the radial variable. And, and this is done at this level. Now, uh, the approximate solution is going to be uh, defined uh, now with uh, two or three slices. I already mentioned that I need a discrete foliation by incoming light cones. Uh, the variables are v0, so this was the initial value v1, v2. You have this foliation by hypersurfaces. You have also a discrete foliation by spheres, so I pick up radius. R1, R2, R3, there is such a sequence, and I look at the spheres, S, R1, S, R2, S, R3, etc. And this foliation is taken to be uh, converging. So there is a parameter uh, behind that to describe the distance. So let's say that delta V is a supremum between two slices, you know, the time V, I, between two slices. And delta R is a supremum between two radius, like, like this, and takes the supremum over all J and over all I to define these quantities. 
these quantities uh, will not be completely arbitrary. So we, we solve a hyperbolic problem, you know, here. So, so there's this idea of uh, finite speed of propagation I already mentioned. And this finite speed of propagation property also comes numerically. So when you discretize a hyperbolic problem, you cannot, in some sense, you cannot have the foliation in time to, uh, to be too rough. So the, f the distance between V1 and V2 and V2, V3 should be sufficiently small compared to your discretization in, uh, in space uh, in order for the scheme to be consistent. So that comes, this is a condition. C star is a speed of propagation like before. And delta V over delta R is a, is a ratio that somehow estimates uh, how fast the speed, the, the waves are propagating at the discrete level of, uh, of the problem. I told you before that uh, I'm going to use a random sequence, an equidistributed sequence, omega i which is a sequence that describes the interval 0i and describes the whole interval in some equidistributed way. So I fix this sequence. And from this sequence, I'm going to define between two radius, so rj minus 1 and rj plus 1, I, I put this omega i here, which goes from 0 to 1. And I'm, I'm going to uh, define, I guess this is not quite well uh, written. What I, I mean by that, sorry, this should be really Rj plus 1 minus Rj minus 1. So the correct uh, formula should be that. Rij uh, should be Rj minus 1 plus omega i Rj plus 1 minus Rj minus 1. So this is a, you have a random sequence. If, if your omega is, is 0, you get Rj minus 1. And if your omega is 1, you get Rj plus 1. Right? So what you do with this is that you select randomly a point between Rj minus 1 and Rj plus 1. So this is a, what I mentioned before. Uh, okay, so near the axis, this is not uh, a relevant quantity that uh, I, I will use. And now I can describe the scheme. I can describe the method. Right? So I have this foliation, the discrete foliation by hypersurfaces. I have also discretized with the spheres. And I need somehow to jump from one hypersurface to the other. And on each hypersurface, I have an approximation, initially in particular, which is piecewise constant. So uh, M uh, uh, sharp, V sharp on the initial line, initial hypersurface, is given by uh, m, you know, choosing the initial data at the point Rj plus 1. And this is something that you impose in this interval, Rj, Rj plus 2. You do something similar for A uh, sharp and B sharp. You pick up the values that these functions are taking initially, and you pick up uh, in, in some interval. Right? So there is always a, a length of 2 if you, if you like, in, in one of these intervals. So there is a shift between these and, and the first and, and the second and third line. But uh, okay, it's important for the construction, but uh, maybe you can uh, forget about that. So, so essentially, you just pick up from the initial data uh, some, some specific value at some point. And that produces something piecewise constant with a good control on the total variation. Now, let's assume that I have done my construction and I have already covered all the discrete foliations up to some uh, value vi. And, and I want to recover uh, to define my approximate solution on this hypersurface. So this is the way I proceed. I use the equidistributed sequence in order to define my piecewise constant approximation on the light cone I want to treat. So hvi, uh, I sit on this, uh, on this cone, and I, I defined the values of h uh, of m sharp and v sharp as a function of r. r is a variable on, a, on, on this hypersurface. And I, I define it uh, on for at the point vi, at the time vi, by looking at the values at earlier time. So vi minus. So I'm actually in, in, including a jump, as I said before. So, so you have jumps. You have discontinuities somehow everywhere. So you, 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 you start from a, f a slice, say so the slice vi minus 1, and you, you have a solution that contains shocks and is defined up to vi. But the way that you recover from vi minus, you know, from the time before to vi plus, the way that you, you, you do this is, is discontinuous. And, and more than that, not only it's discontinuous, but it's random. So you choose randomly 
by, by this number here, a value that you had uh, in your previous uh, slice. What's important is that now my approximate solution here is piecewise constant, uh, and especially if I do the same for A uh, sharp and B sharp, so this is just a similar uh, idea that I, I use for A and B. And, and now I am in, in a situation to, to use a Riemann solver, to use this Riemann problem. So the approximation within the coming, the next space-time region limited by HVI and HVI plus one and, and two spheres. So in this region will be given by the Riemann solution that I described before. I mean, I partially describe it. I told you that in the homogeneous case, I will give you uh, essentially an explicit form and I have added the effect of the geometry. Okay. So this definition here is telling you that if you, if you, if you want your solution locally, you solve the Riemann problem, so you get a function that depends on V and R, and you solve the Riemann problem at a, at a point where you sit now. So I'm, I'm on, on a slice at a given time, at a given radius. So this is a point where you put your discontinuity, and the Riemann solver solves this discontinuity uh, by, by, by this uh, formula here. So you have a given fluid, uh, initial fluid quantities, and you have also some local geometry, which is also prescribed to, to you locally. So that's g essentially given by some, uh, some formula. And you also uh, recover, now you recover A sharp and B sharp uh, by this uh, integral formula. So they make sense because I have told you what M sharp and V sharp uh, was, these quantities, so these quantities are the ones that you have from the top line here. Okay. So everything is, uh, is defined. And now it remains to repeat step one to four. You have advanced by between one, you know, two slices. And you continue the construction to the next region. And eventually, you construct uh, all the geometry and all the matter content of your space time, as long as you don't have any collapse of bounds, and et cetera. Right. So, the so uniform bonds are not uh, that easy to establish. Uh, you, you want them to be independent of the parameters of the discrete uh, foliations. And there are two principles. There is one which uh, we call in invariant region uh, principles. I mean, there are two properties. One is the fact that the, the mass, um, normalized mass and the normalized velocity remain positive and, and negative. So this is something that you have to show uh, is preserved. Uh, in, your, in your scheme. And there is also an invariant region principle uh, at the level of the Riemann invariant. So, so maybe that's something we will see a little bit later. Uh, and the second principle is a principle for the total variation. So you want, I mean, you have this sequence of approximate solutions, and now you want to derive uniform bound, right? So, so you, you can compute the total variation the way I defined it before. But, uh, but this quantity would be difficult or maybe impossible to estimate. And it turns out that the right quantity to control is in terms of the log of this normalized uh, mass density. So this quantity turns out to be the, the, the right quantity to, to use uh, if, you have, if you want to have a monotonicity property and to have a, a decrease. Essentially, you want to show that the total variation is decreasing in, uh, in your scheme. I mean, there are lower order terms, but at the main level, it's, it's, it would be a decreasing quantity. So in, in the rest of this uh, chapter, uh, I guess it's going to depend on the time, but uh, we may have time. I want to tell you more about these two principles, how you control the subnorm and, and, and the BV norm. But of course, I'm going to do that. The full proof is quite technical. I mean, you have to derive uniform estimates for the whole scheme. So, so that involves a lot of steps. Uh, and I'm not going to present that here. And in order to illustrate the sort of ideas that are behind this, what I can do, I can show you the Riemann problem in the uh, homogeneous case, where you forget about the geometry. So it's really the simplest uh, possible uh, setup. You forget about the coupling with the geometry. Uh, but there are still very I interesting uh, things to, to be said. And, and you will see here these two properties for the subnorm and for the total variation to appearing. 
So let, let's do that. So the Riemann problem in Eddington Finkelstein coordinates. I'm, I'm looking at, uh, at very local properties of, uh, of the essential Euler system. So again, you forget the geometry, uh, the coupling, and you suppress these geometric terms. You just want to see the local behavior, like you, you would see a blow up. Near, near a point. So you can think of the metric coefficients to, to be uh, prescribed and even to be constants. That's what I, I'm going to do here. But you, you will see that even this problem is not that simple, right? So you have this, uh, this system. Uh, we will see that it's uh, hyperbolic and we will put an, a jump for that. And I, I just want to explain how you solve this with a jump initially. Uh, so the unknowns are m positive v negative as, as before, and a and b are, are simply constants here. So it looks, you know, it doesn't look so uh, complicated, but uh, but you, you will see that still a lot of things that can be said about that. First uh, point is a strict hyperbolicity. So if you um, if you express m and v in terms of the conservative variable, capital U. Uh, so capital U has two components, U1 and U2, and, U2, and I, I, I'm going to, to use these relations between the physical variables M and V uh, and, and the conservative variables uh, U1 and U2. The flux quantity can also, of course, be expressed in terms of, uh, of these conservative variables. And this is what I need. I, I need this quantity if I want to compute the eigenvalue. So I, I'm simply now computing the uh, Jacobian matrix corresponding to this, uh, this flux quantity. So you differentiate this, but not with respect to the physical variables, but uh, with respect to, to the conservative variables. Okay, this is what is relevant. And you get that. So lambda 1, lambda 2 are the eigenvalues def defined in this way. And they are the wave speeds of the system. They are expressed in terms of uh, u1, u2a, and the, and the sound speed, small k is the sound speed. And since the sound speed is between 0 and 1, b is positive, v is negative, you can check easily that this lambda 1 is less than lambda 2. Uh, and therefore, the system is strictly hyperbolic. It has two eigenvalues, which are real, uh, distinct. There is uh, an important property. Now you would like to know, uh, you, you, you would like to know if your system is, uh, is non-linear, or how much non-linear it is in some sense. So this is a quantity that you should compute. You should look at the eigenvalues, our, uh, eigenvectors, R1 and R2, corresponding to, to our system. So they, they are computed in, uh, in this form. So these are the right eigenvectors of the Jacobian matrix of, uh, given by this uh, function, f. And what you need to compute, you need to compute the, this dot uh, product, so the variation of lambda 1 in the R1 direction and the variation of lambda 2 in the R2 direction. And these two quantities turns out to satisfy this inequality. You just look at the you know, quantities, you, you know k, so this is the same ratio here, but k is between 0 and 1. So you see easily that you have this inequality. And most importantly, this, this, uh, num these quantities, these functions, uh, do not vanish. And these functions express the fact that the speed, lambda 1, lambda 2, are the speed. So the speed of propagation in your system are changing. They are not constants. They change in a, in a non-trivial way uh, along uh, these vectors, r1 and r2. And which are, it turns out that they are the relevant uh, directions where you, you, you want to look at, uh, at the wave speeds. Okay. But the point is that the wave speeds are, are changing. They are not constant. And, and the fact that they are not constant is uh, quantified uh, by, by these quantities. So, so to summarize, if you, if you look, if you put yourself in a simpler setup of a uh, homogeneous system with, with a uniform uh, background, you get a system which is strictly hyperbolic with real and distinct uh, wave speeds, and you have this genuine nonlinearity property. Now, a little bit more uh, about our system. Uh, you, you have the expression lambda 1, lambda 2 here. So you can check these uh, inequalities, you can check the signs, right, of lambda 1, lambda 2 uh, with respect to 0. And you see that uh, depending on, uh, on the velocity of the fluid, depending on the parameter A, so you, you remember that A came, uh, for instance, in the Schwarzschild metric as one, you know, one of the coefficients, the sign of A was, was uh, important. And, and this is something that we uh, also can observe here. 
if you especially look at the last case, the two eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, are negative if the speed is less than this quantity. And <coughs> this tells you that in a region where A is negative, so if A is negative, <coughs> this quantity here will be positive, but you know that V is negative, so this inequality will always be true. And therefore, uh, the two eigenvalues will be uh, both negative. So you are in a situation when A is negative, you, you recover the, the idea of, uh, of before, where I was telling you that the geodesics, the outgoing geodesics, was actually going towards the center. And this is something that we see here for the fluid as, as well. Uh, the two eigenvalues in, in that uh, situation are negative, and the fluid is going towards the center. We have formation of shocks for, for this system. So this is not something I can, I can show you uh, in today, but uh, um, the, the way to do it is to follow characteristics of our hyperbolic system and write along a characteristic an equation for the derivative, the transverse derivative, transverse to, to that characteristic. And when you do that, you get a Riccati type equation, which, as we know, depending, of course, on the sign condition, is going to blow up uh, in finite time. This phenomena is, is exactly, even though now I'm talking about a system of uh, equations, the analog phenomena occurs even for this very simple equation, the so-called Burgers equation, where you have a time derivative of, of some variable u, some function u, and here you have the product u times the uh, radial derivative of, of u. So this equation has exactly the same phenomena of uh, formation of shocks. The gradient becomes, uh, uh, goes to infinity in finite time. This motivates a study of the Riemann problem, that is putting a, a single jump initially and wondering how this jump will evolve. That's what I'm doing here. I have a hypersurface HV prime, uh, a radius R prime, and I, I put a jump for my homogeneous uh, Euler system exactly at R prime and at the time V prime. The data here uh, are, of course, associated to uh, mass and velocity data. And on, on both sides, UR is determined by the mass and the velocity on the, on the right side. You have the sign uh, as before. So I, I give you this system, you know, I give you a jump at some location, and I, I would like to know how this jump, uh, what this jump will produce. And there is a first remark that the problem is invariant by scaling. I mean, we have somehow we have done. Uh, everything in order to, to get this property. So the system is homogeneous, we have put constant coefficients, and now our system is invariant by scaling from the point R prime, V prime. So you can expect to find a solution that only depends on this uh, scale variable R minus R prime over V minus V prime. That's what we are going to do now. The Riemann problem on a, on a uniform background uh, for the homogeneous system admits a unique solution, a unique weak solution with, with shocks, with discontinuities, which is self-similar, meaning that it depends on, on this uh, ratio of space and, and time. And what uh, is interesting for, for, for the analysis is that you can construct this solution explicitly by putting together two types of solutions. One type is simply keeping this initial jump uh, as it is and propagating this jump in time. That's one way to evolve an initial discontinuity. And another way is to replace this initial discontinuity by, by uh, a, a continuous function. And the two uh, picture I could, I could make uh, is is to, to say that if initially you have a jump, that this jump may propagate and remain as it is, or it could uh, create an, an intermediate region, and this intermediate region it will be continuous, will be called a rarefaction. This will be called a, a shock. And what I, I'm telling you is that an initial discontinuity can evolve in this way or in, in this way, remain discontinuous or become continuous you know, immediately in time, and, 
and evolve in a certain way. I mean, of course, everything is, is explicit, is, uh, is uh, something we can uh, specify. So this is a rough uh, statement. Of course, I didn't tell you precisely what a rarefaction or a shock is. So I'm, I'm going to do that in a few minutes. So the second statement in this theorem is that you have an invariant uh, domain uh, property for the Riemann problem which is stated in the so-called uh, Riemann invariance. So W and Z are functions of uh, capital M, capital V. I'm going to give you the expression in a minute. And they come when you, when you want to do a, some kind of diagonalization of your system. So, so this quantity will, uh, will come about. And the statement that I'm making here is that if you know initially that your Riemann data uh, belongs to uh, a set uh, defined in this, in this way in a Riemann invariance coordinate, then the, so if you know that initially for your data, then the solution will remain in, the, in this domain. So there is a maximum principle, if you like, but which is not in, a, in a physical variables. It is not in the conservative variables, capital U, that are also introduced for another reason, but it is in a third uh, set of uh, variables, these uh, Riemann invariance. So you have to somehow juggle with, uh, uh, with these things uh, to to make uh, the full analysis. Shock curves and rarefaction curves. So I'm now entering a little bit more into the construction. How do I define a shock and a rarefaction? So the story begins with, uh, with a Riemann invariance, WZ, associated with the Euler system. So by definition, WZ are functions of capital U, of our conservative variable, and they are defined by uh, saying that they are constant functions, they are functions that are constant along the integral curves of the eigenvectors. So what it means is that when you differentiate along R1, W, you get 0. If you differentiate Z along R2, you get 0. So that's the definition. And if you, if you look at what it means, uh, it allows you to express W and Z as functions of uh, this normalized velocity and this normalized uh, mass energy density uh, with a coefficient involving the sound speed. So this will be my definition for W and Z. And, and again, the principle that I stated before is, is stated in terms of that. So again, it's not in terms of V or in terms of V or in terms of M or, or the conservative variables, but in terms of this specific combination. Okay. This Riemann invariance can be used immediately to define rarefaction waves. So rarefaction waves are continuous solutions of your PDE which are determined by the integral curves of R1 and R2. So what I'm doing here, what I do here, I look for smooth solutions that process this uh, uh, scaling in invariance that I, I, you know, I have for the Riemann problem itself. So you look for specific solutions, continuous solutions, that only depends on this ratio, R minus R prime over V minus V prime. So you plug that into your system, and your system becomes that, right? Again, I remind you, it's homogeneous. A and B are constant. So, so it's rather uh, you know, simple. You have this Jacobian matrix with respect to the conservative variable minus, so xi is this self-similarity variable. Uh, dxi xi of u is 0. And if you somehow solve for that, you analyze what are all the possible continuous solutions with this scaling property. You, you get that they can be described very nicely in terms of, uh, of w and z. And, and that's not difficult to see according to this, uh, this property here. If you basically multiply that by because the gradient of W and Z, you, you, you see that th that's what they are. And more precisely, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to, to, to define something I will call a, a rarefaction curve and a rarif another rarefaction curve corresponding to the two speeds. We have two speeds, uh, I guess I call lambda 1, lambda 2 in our problem. So there will be two rarefaction curves, which will be from a given state, u0 will be a constant value. You can think of this u0 as being the left state or the right state in our Riemann problems, the initial Riemann problem we want to solve. So you take one of, uh, of the values on the right or the left, and you, you look at the curve where w remains constant, or z remains constant. And you, you call this a rarefaction curve, and these curves are give you basically the, the trajectory of the continuous part I, I put on the blackboard when I, I draw a rarefaction uh, solution. Okay. So the rarefaction curve describes the values achieved 
by a rarefaction. Um, in Riemann invariant coordinates, this is what uh, I'm doing. So uh, I'm adding here another idea. So basically the first part and the last part here, this is exactly what I, I told you, where now I pick up the left state or the right state. So that's what I just uh, told you. We take the initial state on each side, and we just follow constant Riemann invariance. But I add one uh, additional ingredient here. I'm only taking the part where z is less than z on the left side. Or, or in the second case, I only keep the part where w is greater than w on the right side. So this, is, this defines half curves, if you like. So the picture which is behind this is of this, uh, of this sort. If I am in a, in a phase space for the, the Euler system, what I'm now telling you is that I can define a curve from a, a left state. A left state, I can define a curve I'm calling uh, R1 of U left. And I can define another curve here where I would start from. So this is a plane. Um, you know, capital U, so capital U is a conservative variable. So you, you, you can make a picture in, a, in the plane of this uh, conservative variable where, uh, where here I put, uh, I, put a, I put the density, the normalized density, and here I put the normalized velocity. And I'm plotting two curves, R1 of UL, and I, I have another curve here, R2 of UL, which are representing by these properties that the Riemann invariant should be constant along these curves. So, so far, I have only told you this about these two curves here. I mean, they're really half curves, if you like. And, and again, the, what they represent, what they represent are the values taken by a rarefaction solution. If I, if I look at this solution, an initial jump will split, will, will, will become a continuous uh, profile, and the continuous profile is described by these curves. So let me summarize uh, the case of rarefaction like this. The one rarefaction curve is described in Riemann invariance, but it can also be described, of course, in terms of m and v by, by this. Uh, the second curve is, is a similar formula. And we have certain monotonicity property. So now if we move along these curves, we realize that the wave speed, and of course the choice of the sign here was done for that purpose, the wave speed have certain monotonicity. When we move along the curve, one wave speed will be increasing, the other one will be decreasing, and this is going to be uh, crucial for the construction. I guess you will understand that in a, in a few minutes. And we have also some asymptotic property of these curves that we can, we can easily uh, find. Okay. So, so I have introduced curves in a phase space for the Euler system. And these curves represent continuous solutions that have the scale invariance property. L let me skip that. Now we need more, right? So if we only work with smooth solutions, it's not going to work. So we need to work with shocks, with discontinuities. And, and this is a place where the rankine ugonio conditions come. Two co if you give me two constant states with a single discontinuity, this, uh, this discontinuity can be, um, can be a solution, a weak solution of your system, provided it propagates with a speed which I call s of u l u r, which is uh, determined by this relation. So u is a U is, uh, is our conservative variable, the flux variable. So what I'm doing here, I look at the jump. On each uh, value of this jump, I have a conservative variable and a flux. And I look at the jump of, of the conservative variable, the jump of the flux. And I, I want to be able to find an S, a scalar quantity S, so that S times the jump of U is, is a jump of F. Right. Maybe it's a case, maybe not. And if it is a case, then I would call this uh, discontinuity a shock. And the shock will, it will be a solution, a weak solution of the problem if I move this shock with a speed given by, by, by this quantity. So we need to analyze that. Uh, but before we do that, there are another ingredient I, I may, uh, maybe I can 
talk about it afterwards, but there is a condition on, on the speed of the shock. So some of these shocks will be called admissible, other will be called non-admissible. Uh, there are inequalities that you impose on, on the speed of propagations, which are there to guarantee uniqueness and stability of the Riemann solution. So what you want to construct, obviously, is not a solution that will be completely unstable if you change the, your initial data. So you want something uh, stable, um, and, and there are plenty of reasons to impose restriction of this sort. I, you can relate this to the second principle of thermodynamics, uh, also. So we impose some inequalities on, on the shock, on the speed that we allow in our construction of the discontinuities, and uh, this is a notation, so I'm now introducing some functions of a parameter beta, it doesn't matter what, exactly what they are, and I have another quantity sigma plus or minus defined by this, it's also a function of beta, but now it also depends on, uh, on the geometry quantity A, B. And so just take some functions defined by that. And uh, the statement that comes now is that the one shock curve from a state, UL, uh, is, is given by that. So I need to tell you wh what I mean by the shock curve. But I'm now uh, you know, going, uh, making my, my construction more complete by not only having curves that correspond to the uh, rarefactions, but I have now on this picture some additional curves that uh, extend the rarefaction, if, if you like, by, uh, on this side, S1 of UL, and on this side, I have something I will call S2 of U, uh, of U I guess, uh, sorry, this should have been an, uh, an R, and this is an R, and this is an L, and this is a, a right. So I'm now defining two additional curves, and these curves, of course, they are not the values achieved by uh, or not exactly that, they will be defined from the shock. You, what you do here to draw these curves is that you fix, you fix some left state and you, you, you wonder if, if, I, if I see a shock that satisfies all the requirements to, to, to satisfy the rankine ugonio conditions and the shock admissibility conditions. So, so if you have that, what are all the possible values that are achieved uh, across the discontinuity? So, and the curve now does not represent the profile of the rarefaction, but it's, it's the analog of that, if, if you wish. It, the curve represents the states that you can reach by uh, crossing, by going through uh, a shock of, uh, of any admissible speed. So, that the expression I wrote here is obtained by solving the jump conditions, and by solving the jump condition, you get the expression that are on the, on the screen. And you have also monotonicity property, where the speed, but now the, what is relevant is not the characteristic speed, the shock speed. The shock speed have also certain uh, monotonicity property and some asymptotic property. Okay. So, so to summarize, what I, I do, I look for regular solutions, and I, I get these curves, these rarefaction curves. I look for single jumps, and I, I get the shock curves, which are, are there, and now, I combine these two, two together in order to solve the Riemann problem, right? So essentially, the Riemann problem, I, I can see the solution from, uh, from this picture. You, you give me two states for, for, the, for the Riemann problem. And what I do is, I, I don't know if the, the solution will contain shocks or refractions. So I look at the curves that are defined like I did before, the shock curve for the second family and the rarefaction curve for the second family. And I, I do the same from the left state, but now using the first family, meaning the speed of propagation, lambda one, the, the one that was more uh, negative, if you like, and the two curves correspond to uh, speeds that, are, that were more positive. And, and the Riemann problem is solved by, uh, by taking this uh, intersection point of, uh, of the two curves. And by deciding that my single discontinuity has uh, split, not as I, I mentioned before, I said before, a single discontinuity could propagate as it is or become a rarefaction, but in fact, the story is not that simple. The, the, what happens is that the single, the, the initial jump split into uh, two possible waves. So one wave uh, corresponding to the family one could remain a shock, for instance, and the other wave 
being a, being a right function. Right. So the, the picture is quite, it's quite simple, but you have to be careful with, uh, you know, with the construction which is, which is behind. Uh, and for instance, make sure that when you do such a construction, you want to combine waves together, but the waves have to be, the speed of these waves have to be ordered. Right? You, you don't want the second wave to propagate faster than the first one. The construction would not make sense. So you want a construction where you put together shocks and rarefactions, one way for the family with a smaller speed, and one way for the family with a bigger speed, and you, and you do the construction in a, in a monotone way uh, as far as the speeds are, are concerned. Okay, so, so I have a construction in a phase space, which I have described, and, and then this is associated with a construction in a physical space, and the figure on the blackboard illustrates uh, illustrate the, uh, the point. So in the end, what I have done, for, for this very simplified problem of the Riemann problem, I have told you that I can find explicitly a solution that only depends on the scaling parameter and contains a, sh a wave from one family plus a wave from the other family, and each wave is a shock or a refraction. Let's uh, skip through that. So we are almost at, uh, at, uh, at the end of, uh, of that. So uh, I probably uh, invariant domains is, uh, is an interesting issue, but uh, let me uh, skip that because so you can see there are quite uh, heavy calculations. And I, I want to say uh, something about the total variation right? because that's what we need, right? In the end, you do this construction and you want to control the total variation. And the total variation is, uh, is obtained by looking at a pair of Riemann solutions now associated with our Euler system. So what I'm doing now, I take three states instead of two. I call them UL, UM, UR. I take uh, two radius uh, now instead of one, so R prime, R second. And I, I want now to solve the problem going from UL to UM with one jump and from UM to UR with another jump at different locations. You, you can, of course, combine the Riemann solution. So what I describe, every discontinuity will evolve and will each produce two waves. And you can look at uh, the total variation of the, of the combination. The, the main point is the following. The total variation of, uh, of a Riemann solution could, of course, be defined as we did before. You could just uh, decide that the total variation is a jump here and, and the jump of the, of the initial, the initial jump that you are given is, is, uh, is an estimate of the total variation. But that's not a good quantity because this, would, this quantity would not decrease and would not behave nicely along our foliation in time. So what I do here, I sum the magnitude of shocks and rarefaction waves. I use, and, and so I'm, I'm really solving the Riemann problem, looking at the waves that come out of it, and each of these waves has, um, total variation, and moreover, the total variation for each wave is measured with respect to a specific variable, which is this one, log of m that I, I mentioned before. So remember that m was, was not something completely obvious, right? you had to define it by rescaling the, the mass energy density. So I use this to measure the total variation. So this is a formula that you could say is, uh, is, uh, is uh, natural for the total variation, but it, it involves two ideas. So this is a total variation for log of m, and it involves this intermediate state, m star, which I, I obtained between my two waves. m star was a point of intersection on, uh, of the two curves, that, uh, as I describe it. So that's the good notion of total variation for the problem. And the main statement is that this quantity is monotone. So this quantity is monotone in the following sense. If you give me three states, u, l, u, m, u, r, and you look at this Riemann problem, this Riemann problem, and this one, and you consider the total variation defined by this relation, then you have this uh, statement of uh, monotonicity, like the triangle inequality, if you like, is, uh, is satisfied. So you can replace, if you have these two Riemann problem, in some sense you can replace it by this one, and by doing that you decrease the total variation. And this is the right dynamics and, and how the equations are, are working. 
let me, uh, I guess we are almost, uh, almost done. So I had a few pages to describe spherically symmetric static einstein euler space times because, because that's the way I have formulated the problem, uh, static fluid problem. So le let me just go through it very, uh, very quickly. You assume a time-like killing fields, foliation, the leaves are orthogonal to, to these uh, this, uh, killing fields. Uh, Schwarzschild would be, would be a, an example. And the important point here is to, to solve that, you could, in principle, you could use any, you know, any choice of variables and, and play with that, but, but the system, even though it looks uh, not too complicated, is, uh, it's not easy to get global information about the solutions. And so if you want to do that uh, nicely and, and get a nice result, it's uh, important to introduce uh, the Hawking quasi-local Hawking quasi mass. This is the definition of, uh, of M, M of R. So we are in a static case, so it's just a function of R, uh, also defined from, from here. And from our equations, right, we, we have the equations uh, from, from the Einstein-Euler system. We can see that this uh, combination of um, of, uh, of, the, of the announce satisfies the system. So if you compute the R derivative of the mass, you get this quantity. The V derivative of that, you get this quantity. And then you can start uh, looking at the monotonicity property uh, in terms of R, the monotonicity property in terms of V, etc. And this comes in the analysis of uh, the system. Again, if you want to have a, a global form, you, you have curved geometries that you can recover uh, easily if you, if, you, if you know the Hawking mass and the mass energy density. So, so the point that I, I'm trying to make here is that you have in principle uh, geometry variables and fluid variables to solve for, but uh, if, if you, you know, manipulate that uh, properly, you realize that you can reduce this problem to two announced, two quantities, one which is the physical uh, density, mass energy density mu, and the second quantity you want to use is this uh, Hawking mass. So the coupled system, a solution of a static Euler equation uh, with A positive satisfies system of, uh, of ODEs, which is defined by this. The function can be recovered, the other quantities, the fluid variables, the other fluid variables, and the metric coefficient A and B can be recovered by algebraic formula, except for B, which is given by this integral formula. This makes sense, modulo some integrability at the center that you have to check, but we, we can check that. So that's a formulation of the static problem to be, to be solved. And the solution is uh, done by a Fuchsian uh, argument. You prescribe initial conditions at the center, specifically the density at the center, you uh, impose that the mass is zero at the center, no singularity from the geometry. So you have regularity, which are specified by these two conditions, F0 is zero, mu zero positive fixed, given. The condition on the initial value of M is consistent with M being non-negative. But, he, and this is something that we do in the, in the proof of the COM, you have to check that the second equation of, uh, of the system makes sense, right? If you return to the equation, so you have to, to make sure that uh, that this, this equation will, uh, will indeed make sense, but, but that's something that uh, is done by the theorem. So that exists, given mu zero positive and m zero equal to zero, there exists a unique global solution representing a static uh, uh, fluid. Uh, you have regularity at the center in, in the sense that m is going to zero and mu is going to mu zero. So these functions are smooth, positive, uh, mu is going to zero at infinity, uh, and, and the weak regularity conditions are, are satisfied. It's actually smooth, so it's just a matter of uh, integrability that have to be, to be checked, and, and that's uh, the statement which uh, I'm making here. The regularity at the center is, is satisfied. So, so this is important because I, you know, I stated a result where I say I take a static equilibrium, I make a perturbation, so, so of course this is part of, uh, of the statement of the theorem. I want to close with a few references for this chapter, you, so you can consult uh, this paper. So in particular, earlier to the work I'm presenting, there were a series of papers by Dimitri Christodoulou for the scalar field case. 
If you want to read more about weakly regular self-gravitating fluids with other symmetries, uh, I have a few papers including these, these two. And next time, I'm going to uh, tell you some results about the global geometry, the causal properties of weakly regular spacetimes. So I'm, I'm going to say more uh, about uh, uh, not, not only spherical symmetry, but I will also return to the Gaudi symmetry and the T2 symmetry that uh, we were discussing in previous chapters. Thank you.